Welcome, I'm Lara Danziger Izakov, past president of the ISHLT, and I'm privileged to be here today with Dr. John Kabashigawa, the recipient of the 2023 Lifetime Achievement Award for the ISHLT. We're also joined by Dr. Sharon Hunt, a prior winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award as well. And we're gonna have a conversation with Dr. Kabashigawa and hear some of his thoughts. John. We wanted to start by asking you about the impact that ISHLT has had on your career. We're wondering if you could share some highlights. ISHLT truly ignited my passion for research. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it impacted the lives of our patients, and that's why I started it. I remember my first uh, presentation at the ISHLT, actually. It was something that was rather straightforward, but I think impactful, and that was treating rejection. You know, back then in the 1980s, uh, we treated everyone with 1,000 milligrams of solumedrol. We brought them into the hospital daily for three days. Sharon, you might remember that. Uh, and, oh, yeah. Uh, but it was very costly to do that, too. And at that time, we were playing around with an oral prednisone bolus and tape, just taking 50 milligrams of prednisone twice a day, you know, for three days, and then a little uh, with the tape. So at that time, I randomized uh, about uh, 30 patients with rejection to either IV solumedrol in the hospital or an oral prednisone bolus and taper. Came out with the same results, uh, you know, in terms of outcome, in terms of resolution of the rejection episodes. And that is my first uh, uh, presentation at the ICHLT. And I guess the rest is history as we went on to clinical trials. I just wanted to ask John a, a question about the consensus conference that he has become known for. John, you put on a number of them, and I was wondering uh, about your motivation in doing them and uh, your feeling about the results. They, it's been nothing short of spectacular, at least to most of us. Well, thank you for that uh, question, Sharon. Well, you know, the motivation of the consensus conferences was rather simple. And that is that all these uh, consensus conferences addressed uh, very clinical or very uh, contentious type of uh, questions within our field. First of all, I used a modified Delphi technique uh, when I put together these consensus conferences, basically getting together experts in the field on the topic. And, and that would be our core group. And that core group would be addressed separate questions and maybe four or five you know, uh, sessions, uh, hour sessions or so, once a monthly, maybe five, five times, five months before the, uh, the actual meeting. So we would meet every month. And then we could come up with what are the basic questions that we really want to ask at the consensus conference. And that way we take the broad category of this uh, in, in a very large uh, question and we bring it down to about maybe five to 10 questions that would really be looked at by the entire consensus conference. And by then I would, you know, I would mushroom it out to maybe about a hundred people from across the country around the world in terms of uh, getting the experts and also views of, of, of people who were involved in clinical transplantation. And with that, we were able to come to some consensus uh, in general, in terms of uh, what would best uh, be uh, supportive of our patients and of course, patient outcome. And at the end of the day, you know that's what it's all about. Uh, how can we best treat our patients and uh, improve quality of life as well as improving survival and uh, other outcomes as well? John, it's a fascinating way of interacting and bringing people together. I wonder if you might be able to share with us some of the individuals who've been inspirations and mentors to you, but also some of your mentees. Well, you know, I, I, I have to tell you that my, my first mentor was actually my colleague as well. And that's when I was at UCLA. I just got out of fellowship and, uh, and started in on the heart transplant program. And uh, who was I working with at that time? It was Lynn Stevenson. Well, let me tell you that I learned a great deal from Lynn and uh, we, were, we worked extremely well together. But, but Lynn challenged me. She challenged me in the sense of uh, taking care of these patients, you know, doing the right thing for the right reasons, but also setting up research. You know, I also have to tell you too, another, uh, you know, inspiration was our surgeon at UCLA. And that was Hilo Lax. He also would challenge me. He also would tell me, you know, how are we doing with our patients? What do you think about this project or that project? And 
you know, you are somebody who leads by example. And I think if anything, you know, that's what I've done in many ways by leading by example. And, uh, and that has worked well for me. And, and, uh, and of course, you learn from the best and that was a little less. Well, actually one of my first mentees was Stu Russell. Stu, if you're out there, shout out to you as well. Stu has done an outstanding job, has done great work in mechanical circuitry support. I could not be more proud of him as well. And uh, there's so many others that are out there um, and, uh, that are directors of programs. I don't want to miss anybody, but you know, for all my mentees out there, congratulations. And, and this award is, uh, is to be shared with you as well. The consensus conferences that you put together have resulted in some rather durable uh, markers of acute rejection, of antibody-mediated rejection specifically. Could you comment on specific ones and what you think is more important or less important than others? Well, when you ask me to rate them, it is difficult to rate them, but in terms of durability, well, I, you know, I suppose, you know, we can really start with the biopsy scales, you know, um, and uh, a lot has to do with uh, our, our pathology uh, colleagues. So far, it's enduring. Now, whether it'll continue to stand up, uh, we'll see. I think a lot has to do with the clinical outcome. And now, and now we have some, maybe a little bit more interest in terms of molecular diagnostics. Now we have intrograph mRNA transcripts which might actually tell us a little bit more as to what's going on in the biopsy in terms of clinical pathways that are being activated to maybe tell us whether or not the grading scale is appropriate uh, in terms of the mechanisms that may, may be uh, uh, present. So that was, uh, I think, one of the more important ones as well. Primary graft dysfunction. You know, when we put that together, there was actually no consensus on what is the definition of primary graft dysfunction. People would see it comment on it. And so that actually has been a, a great way to now have a platform, a platform by which we can compare severe primary graft dysfunction from one country to another and uh, look at outcomes and see you know, what works, uh, what may not work, and what risk factors there are. Another one was actually, you might put this on the same uh, boat, and that is uh, multi-organ transplant. We actually had two separate consensus conferences one on heart kidney transplantation. And that's where we put our recommendations on you know, what would qualify, what would be the criteria to, for, to have kidney transplantation. And so I think, yes, we, we've had an impact in terms of how we might view uh, heart kidney transplantation. And finally, frailty. You know, that's a concept that's been out there and we really didn't know what the definition of frailty is, how it impacts outcome and whether or not you can treat frailty even before transplant, and then what about after transplant as well? And so that was pretty exciting why? because we initially started that in all organs, in all organ transplantation. And uh, after that, the organs, you know, uh, separate groups broke up and actually did their own thing, wrote their own papers. So it was really nice to see that uh, we, we brought together all the organs together, heart, kidney, liver, lungs together, and each one broke off after the uh, after that consensus conference, which we did, did publish. And then all the other groups, uh, you know, really did a nice job of frailty in their specific organs. So, you know, whether or not that's going to be enduring or not, I think it was a nice platform. And I think all of our consensus conferences in general was a platform to jump off of and for future reference uh, and to continue, uh, continue to spring new ideas and, and to generate clinical trials, and to have a basis by which to have comparison. Thanks, John. I think this has a, a, been a, a wedding of everyone's appetite to hear your address at the annual meeting. We're looking forward to hearing that. Before we break off today, we'd really like to hear a little bit about what you see as the future of ISHLT, as well as what impact you hope to have on the society moving forward. You know, the ISHLT has, has really been uh, an incredible uh, society uh, by which to treat advanced heart and lung disease. I've always looked at the ISHLT and for the future as leading the way for innovation. Innovation in uh, how we treat uh, our end-stage uh, thoracic uh, organ uh, patients. What do I mean by that? Let, let's see examples, you know, in terms of xenotransplantation, leading the charge in terms of how we might uh, 
uh, make this a reality for people across the across the countries. Bioengineering, you know, replacement organs. No, well, we already have the total artificial heart. Can we improve on that? Absolutely, yes. You know, and that uh, may be evident in the biocore. We'll have to see, you know, how these new bioengineering uh, organs uh, last. We've also looked at molecular biomarkers. This is truly the ICLT moving the field forward. Why? Because it is a centerpiece by which we actually uh, showcase these new technologies. And finally, to look at uh, uh, precision medicine. You know, at, at the end of the day, customized medicine is really what we need to treat our patients. And again, I see the ISHLT you know, as a nidus for bringing together all groups from around the world. You know, and no one can, no other society can actually do that. You know, except for the ISHLT, because why? It's collegial. It's collegial. You know, it uh, truly embraces uh, all members uh, in a very uh, just way. And I think if any, if anything, uh, that is what I have also learned uh, that uh, the ISHLT has really pulled together the goals and also common purpose, common purpose to take care of the patients we serve and to, again, improve quality of life and improve outcome of our patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Kabashigawa and Dr. Hunt for joining us. We really appreciate it. Congratulations again on your award of the Lifetime Achievement Award for the 2023. We look forward to seeing you at the ISHLT annual meeting in Denver, Colorado, where we will hear your address and we will be able to share in celebrating you. Thank you so much. Thank you.